Ayan. Hey everyone, welcome to another AI Conversation. I'm joined today by Zoe Febrero. Welcome Zoe to the show. Hi Doc, um, nice talking to you again after four months, five months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I met Zoe in Cebu during DashCon. And uh, I don't know who approached who, but shortly after that, we got talking about AI. Uh, Zoe actually is a, a working student, or I don't know if that's a proper term, or an entrepreneurial student. So she's still in school, uh, but she's also in the middle of bootstrapping her automation startup. So that's going to be an interesting thing to talk about, no, Zoe. So maybe can you help Muna elaborate exactly what what what's keeping you busy these days, para you know, uh, para people know what you're doing. Sure. Maybe I can start with how I got into the AI automation space okay. first. Uh, so I came from a very, I have a nonprofit heart initially. So I was very into NGOs, um, charities. And so when I was in high school, I started uh, my own NGO. Um, wow. it, it was very uh, small. It was with fellow students or fellow people I met in webinars because this was also around the time of the pandemic. Mm. So a lot of webinars were going on for free. I joined a lot of those and I met um, people from different countries. And so my NGO was composed of those people. Yeah. Uh, eventually, uh, we were bleeding money. I did not have the skills or expertise to grow the NGO. What was the purpose of the NGO, if I might ask? Okay. Uh, so the NGO was very focused on agriculture. So I was very much a climate activist mm -hmm. back in high school. And so I wanted to solve uh, climate change by focusing on agriculture and helping our local farmers here. Um, I was able to work with farmers, talk with farmers, uh, but it was very hard to introduce technology to them mm -hmm. because our mission was to make, to kind of digitalize our agriculture here um, to help them with whether that's production or their distribution channels to reach their customers. But it was very hard to introduce or help them adapt to technology, I would say. Mm. When you say and them, are you referring to individual farm. farmers? The farmers, yes. Uh, we partnered with a farm organization. And so it was already a group of farmers. So that way it was easy for us to communicate with them. Yeah. So it's not, and they go to the city um, every week. So it's not difficult for us to visit or talk to them in person by visiting all their different farms in the provinces. Mm. And so uh, we did uh, a lot of effort for that. But because we were also students at the time, it was, it was taking up a lot of our time and we weren't getting much from it, whether that's monetary, given as an NGO. And we also didn't see much growth from what, what we were doing. When you say growth, and, like how many people deal with you or collaborators? Uh, how do you normally yes, measure it? And also we, we didn't see it going anywhere from there. Mm -hmm. And the team kind of felt like we might not be the best people to help these farmers at the moment. And so the team unanimously decided that, well, I first suggested it, and then we all agreed that we should take a temporary hiatus. And This is before college, right? You were still in high school. Yes, Mama. but when I suggested that we would go into a hiatus, it was like me going into college, just like the same year that I was getting into college also. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, I sorry, correction for that. This was a year after I got into college when I suggested the hiatus. So my first year in college, we were still very much active in the NGO. Then after my first year, that's when we were like, this is taking up too much of our time. Uh, we don't have the necessary skills or expertise, whether that's in marketing and technology mm. um, to really help push this. Um, so let's take a hiatus and figure out what each of us should do individually first. And for me as the one who really led that initiative, it felt like I was lacking in a lot of ways. And it was one of my realizations as a leader where I really questioned what am I bringing to the table? 
uh, because uh, I I've never really led anything outside of the school setting before. Like that was the first time. And so for me, it was more of, okay, my skill here is bringing people together. But when we, when I start to work with people who are way better than me, I like different things. It made me question, okay, how do I lead people who are better than me at different things? Mm-hmm. And it was hard for me to come to terms that I should work with people who are better than me because I've always been, my, the leadership roles I've been in have always been, I'm the best at everything. Or if I'm, for example, in school, I'd be put in leadership roles because I'm the smartest in the group or mm. the best in the group. And so Sounds that's like why- an occupational hazard. <laughs> <laughs> And so I wasn't used to working with people who were better than me. And so when I started working with people who are older than me, which was what happened in the NGO, um, I started questioning what I should do as a leader because I've never experienced this. And so my first response to that was I should be better and increase my skill set. Mm. And so that's one of the reasons why I suggested the hiatus. So once we ha- took a hiatus, my first goal was get better at two things, marketing and technology. So I did not, I didn't know how to go about that yet. And so this was getting into my second year of college. And I decided I should focus in, I should focus on upskilling myself first. So I, I took a leave of absence during my first semester of my second year just to focus on exploring the things I could try out outside of school. And so around August, I decided that the best way for me to upskill myself is to use AI. So August, September, I did a deep dive on AI. Mm-hmm. August was more planning. September was more trying things out. You were by yourself doing this or did you have a yes. group to swap ideas with? Uh, this was by myself. I was huh? mostly at home during these times. Mm-hmm. So August, I was, it was a deep dive research on AI. I built a database uh, of like AI tools I could use. September was when I was using these tools inside the database. And this is also around the time I found a platform called AirOps, which mm-hmm. was a platform where I could build workflows. And so come October, uh, this now is when I decided I should build a brand around this AI automation. This is also around the time I was looking for ways on how I could further upskill myself in marketing and technology. And that's when I came across the internship at SIMF or to be an AI content intern. It just felt so perfect because it was marketing. It was a marketing role, but it was using technology, in this case, AI. So the role required me to create content marketing using AI. So mga copywriting, ganyan? You do that? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so I applied for the internship. I got in, but of around a week or two before I started the internship, I'd already launched my own brand as well. And, and so that's, so they pretty much started around the same time. I was doing, I was supposedly going to do the internship for three months until December. And around November, I got my first client uh, for my brand, uh, where I had to build a automated workflow on AirOps, which was also marketing related. And so I continued doing that. That first project got finished by like December, I would say. It took a, it took a while to finish that project. And I don't think I handled that first project very well. Um, I, and then we move on to January. Uh, Why, what, I, what, if I if I might ask, what happened in that last project? The first one. Uh-huh. Uh I would say I don't think I communicated expectations to the client well. To the I, client. Okay, got it. To the client. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I was able to build the workflow okay, but I think it's more on the communication part that I think I needed to improve. Yeah. And so uh, December came, and the reason why I had to, 
I did I wanted to stop my internship on December is because I had to go back to school by January, which is second semester. Since my term for the leave of absence was only until the first week of January. And so January came and now more AI stuff is going on inside Simf. And so I decide, let me just extend it for a bit more indefinitely uh, since I want to be involved in this. And so I extend my internship a while as I go back to school in the second semester and I'm still continuing my brand. And this is probably around the time I'm also dealing with my second client for my brand. And so uh, with all these AI uh, initiatives going on in SIMF, eventually uh, people heard that I was using a platform called AirOps to automate workflows. And then I was asked to do a demo to the team. And so from there, uh, I'd say that's when most people in the team knew me since the only people I knew in the team were the marketing, which were only three people. And so a quick workshop internally. For Who did you do a workshop for? Simf? Yeah, internal. It was like an internal workshop um, for AirOps. And then I supposedly got offered a job, but now it's more of a partnership with Simf. So I'm leading, I'm still continuing to lead my brand. And if there's any development needed for a client or for the brand, that's when Simf would come in. And so that's that's what I'm managing right now is my brand. And right now I'm at my sixth project client. or client. Okay. Wow, Everything. congrats. Since you started, no? Kailan yun? October then, since the last yeah. time we met. November. November was when I got November. Started. Okay. Six yeah. clients in the span of two, three months. It's pretty good. Um, I mean, for a relatively new brand, unless you have a network already. Okay. And these are all, I'm assuming, remote gigs, no? Yeah. Primarily. Okay. Because they understand that you're still a student, etc. no? Um, I actually don't know if they know I'm a student because they they usually don't ask. And the moment we get on the discovery call, they just start talking about we just start talking about the project. Yeah. So after that, so right now, um, I'm in school. I have three more years to go. Yeah, I, you're a freshie basically, or no sophomore, naba. Yeah, just started sophomore pretty much. Okay, amazing. <laughs> Pero you're keen on finishing. I hope you don't mind me say yeah. asking that. Ha? Kasi yeah. may iba, like I interviewed someone recently, she made a decision to just let go of her degree kasi hindi raw niya makita yung, yeah. at yung relevance of the what what she was studying. Um, and uh, parang the world of tech awaits, lalo na data, data analysis, data science. So made a job. So far, so good kind of doing well um i think <laughs> and meron din siya mga fractional they call it fractional Bar par back in the day we called it part time <laughs> and fractional cto jobs no which mukhang bumebenta rin because there's some companies they don't really need a full time tech lead or maybe they just need a tech lead for crises um that's one approach um okay sige so back to you studying and yeah. in and any immediate business business plans while you're finishing school? Uh no, not really. I think while I'm in school, I'm gonna continue doing my brand. Um, I think I'd only I can see myself really scaling this brand when I'm about to graduate, I would say. Right now it's a bit hard for me to scale with the limited time I have or really grow the brand with the limited time I have. And so that's just been my kind of routine these days, uh, school in the morning. Um, and then afternoon to evening, I work on the brand, especially since most of my clients are in the U.S. So U.S. time, I work mostly late night. Oh, Doc, I think you're mute. I was saying that's a good way to bootstrap your... your... Your journey, no? See, you're still studying, but you're getting paid. 
and then you're little by little expanding your horizons. So, so what does it look like in three years? You finally launch an agency or a consultancy? Are you doing it now in terms of a brand, or is it still just Zoe Febrero as a brand? Oh, I really have a brand. It's called Alba. Alba, okay. Yes. Um, and so a lot of people, a few people have asked me, like, do you want to change the name? Or like, how did you come up with that name? Why? Why do they want you to change the name? What's wrong with it? <laughs> I think it's because uh, someone told me this. Uh, Jessica Alba. But, gonna... Yes. <laughs> ah, okay. But nga ba Alba? What does it mean? Uh, so initially, because the industry, the niche that I'm in is... um an A is triple A. So AI automation agency. So like yeah. there is really um triple A's like abroad that are existing. Mm. And so I wanted the name to be related to that. Like still something like triple A, a name that had three A's in it. And the first name that I came up with last year was all about AI. But that seemed a bit too long. So I shortened it and it became Alba. All about AI. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I don't think. Ano ba yung, isn't there a watch that's called Alba? No, I'm trying to think of. Parang Seiko Rado. Wait, let me double check. Um, or baka Alva naman. Alba watches. Medyo classic na ano na yan eh. O oh, Alba nga meron. Na relo. <laughs> albawatches.com mga ka, ano siya kakabatch ni na Seiko ni na ano ni na ano yung isa pang uso not Rolex Rolex a bit too high end no? Seiko Rado and Alba okay okay sige so um as i was telling you earlier uh you know offline parang the world of automation and the world of AI actually don't commingle a lot at least from my perspective do you agree with that? And if ever, why, why do you think that's the case? I think maybe traditional automation before ChatGPT even became a trend doesn't really mingle with AI a lot. Though I do think, especially now, there's AI and automation hold hands a lot for, for me, like working with automation. When I get into, like getting into the automation space, you it's hard to not see ai now like you'll you'll find ai once you enter the automation space mm -hmm. and um so for me i'm very focused on generative um ai so this is more on automating digital processes that might need content generation or data extraction data formatting and so i'm not sure about other types of automation when it gets uh, deeper, like deeper into the automation industry where hardware is involved or we're dealing with more complex workflows. Does, uh, no, really... does RPA fall under your, parang your domain? Si meron ding robotic process automation. Is that similar to what you're trying to do? I would say like automation is like a really big bubble. RPA is one of it. And then what I'm doing is also like another bubble inside it. So, but I... Right now, what I'm doing does not touch RPA. Okay. Because that's another thing that's quite uh, popular. Yeah. Um, in the, I guess, the BPO sector, where, where I work uh, a lot nowadays. And maybe a perspective, Seguro, no? why do you think generative AI and automation go well together? What is it about the nature of automation in general? I think it depends also on the automation use case. Mm -hmm. In my case, uh, the automations that I focus on is very much digital. So um, these are brands that might need automation in terms of marketing or let's say um, HR filtering or kind of just business processes that involve some kind of content generation. And I think the reason why a lot of businesses uh, look for automating um, content generation using Gen AI is because it's probably one of the more time consuming tasks. Like for example, before AI writing a blog would take 
hours, if not a day. Like you need to do research, um, write a draft, review it, and then revise. You you might even need to do that twice. Now you don't you could take a few seconds or even a few minutes to write a blog. And so I think that's why um Gen AI is um really attracting a lot of brands, businesses, and it's going really well with automation is because it's one of the more time-consuming things to do in a business. Do you see you know, automation contributing to job losses? I think that's the, the showbiz question. Eh? Because I get that a lot. AI will contribute to job losses. And currently, the at least the stance of the BPO sector is not necessarily, or it's not, if ever, it's not, it's gonna, not going to be broad. Maybe some jobs get augmented, modified, maybe some jobs are consolidated. But by and large, uh, BPO CAI is co- kind of a way of expanding capacity as opposed to reducing headcount. Does that assumption hold true for automation? I mean, it's probably less AI and it's more about automation. Or what do you think of that? I think... Um... I think it depends on the perspective, but for me, here, this is how I see it. Um, the Gen AI will definitely, I feel, contribute to not necessarily a, a loss of jobs, but maybe a change of jobs. Meaning, for example, let's take a blog writer or like an SEO specialist. You um before AI you hired an SEO specialist to write blogs for your domain or your website. Um now that AI came, I if I'm the one managing that team, that SEO specialist, I would say I don't need you to be an SEO specialist anymore because I can we have AI to do that. Instead of being an SEO specialist, of needing an SEO specialist, what I would need is someone who can manage the AI that writes the blogs now. So that's how I see it. It's, it's not necessarily a loss of jobs, but a change of job descriptions or job roles that are available to the people now that AI is here. And so um, the main way to tackle that is definitely upskilling because it's, uh, I think this is also a saying that's uh, been kind of going around, but you're not going to necessarily lose your job to AI, but you're going to lose it to someone who's good at using AI. Mm-hmm. So in that case, let's say from what you're seeing from your clients, are they u- using this parang service of yours to get over the need to have a human doing things? In do, you, do you detect that? Because I, I think when you add up all of that, that's definitely going to change the job market for sure. Yeah. I would say there are some, uh, there are some clients that w- that are availing of my service, so they can save money and time, mm. um, compared to like hiring someone to do that like every month for them. Now they have a workflow that can even run on a schedule that just so, does it. So they have not yet hired, and rather than exploring hiring, they get you to solve that problem, na parang ganun. Yes. Oh, okay. especially since most of my clients are very early stage um, in the business so these aren't the clients I'm working with aren't big corporations yet and very like start up early stage and so um, they haven't hired that much people um, if they have it's more of these their team members are going to be using the workflows that I've built for them mm-hmm. okay Um. let's geek out a bit Maybe uh, can you take us through exactly what's a typical workflow? Actually, if you if you want to share some stuff, no no problem. No, because for a lot of people watching this, they might be wondering what what automation are they really looking for? Like sometimes I I use uh, Excel macros as a as a euphemism, but it's far more than that, deba. Right? So can you take us through like a typical like problem that clients approach you for, and then how you normally resolve it? No. Uh, using whatever tools you have at your disposal. Yeah. So right now my tech stack is still AirOps. Um, mm-hmm. ever since last year, it's very. I just found it very user friendly, and it's very easy to test and build prompts, um, and access AI models there. Yeah. Uh, I 
I love the outputs that Claude Three Opus is giving, especially when it comes to um, article writing. Uh, and it sounds less like AI compared to the GPT-4 turbo model. I would say it's just a really expensive. The Claude Three Opus model is just very expensive to use. Um, and so um, I'll try to take you through a very common workflow, I would say, that I get, which is writing blogs or articles. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the reason why that's a common workflow I get as a request um, for, that clients ask me to build is because I think people are starting to rec- realize that just asking chat GPT for a blog or an article is still gonna, it's gonna sound very much like AI. Mm-hmm. Um, if you just like ask it to write an article without giving it much detail, that article is not gonna do well um, in terms of SEO. And so that's one of uh, my usual requests, I would say. And so how my automation workflows work is um, we start with an input. There's a process in the middle and then it gives an output. Mm -hmm. So let's say input fields would be a keyword, a title. Um, Who is this article for? So your audience what tone and voice do you want the article to have? You could even add samples. You can even add a tone and voice URL sample. So a link to an article whose tone and voice you really like, mm-hmm. um, or a link to a blog that you've written before and you want the workflow to mimic that tone and voice of that blog. Yeah. You could also add uh, an input fields for references that you might want the AI to use when writing the article. And so, um, it really depends. Um, the client might specify these. Sometimes they'd ask me to just determine which input fields are best for this workflow. And so from there, from the input, now I add steps into the workflow. Mm-hmm. So step one could be, okay, so taking a step back, these input fields can be either optional or required. Usually all of them are optional. And so um, it's up to the user of this workflow what inputs they're going to give. Um, and I need to make sure that the workflow still runs, whether they only give the keyword, whether they only give the title, mm-hmm. or whether they only give a URL reference. And so um, how this would work is let's say they give a keyword. First step would be it checks if it gives a, if the user gave a keyword, then it uses that. If not, then we look for an optimal keyword to use um, given whatever inputs they've given. And so there's going to be a step for the title, checking if there's a title, there's going to be, and eventually there's going to be a step writing the blog. Um, But how it usually goes is we start with an outline. Um, The workflow writes out an outline for the blog. And then that gets pushed into a step that writes the blog. And this is really where prompt engineering is a must. Like you cannot to get really good output for my clients, I cannot just do the simple chats that the very like simple chats that you might use on chat GPT. Like, okay, write me a blog about blank. And that's all you give. No, like I need to give it a lot more context and I'll need to use um, different prompting methods depending also on the use case. Usually for blogs, since it's pretty long, I would go with one shot, one shot prompting. And so I give a system prompt um, and then I give one user assistant pair and then end it with a user prompt. And so system, um, for those who's listening that might not be familiar, system prompt, um, maybe doc, you might, do you want to expound on this since that's what your topic is mostly about for prompting? Prompting, no? <clears throat> well, anyway, in general, as uh, some people already know, I do conduct prompt engineering classes publicly, you know, and this was a deliberate decision of mine since I started ge- getting active in social media about AI exactly one year ago today. You no, know, uh, I started becoming active in March, but pretty much for the first know, about six months or so, it was more about being more, being more of a spokesperson or evangelist. So I'll join events I'll talk about Gen AI because there's no one doing it. eh? And then that's what led me to DashCon and met you. But then approaching fourth quarter, I realized, um, although there were prompt engineering classes available online, eh? free pa eh? But for many of them, 
Uh, I don't know how well the adoption is. I think if you're fairly techy, you probably could learn it. Uh, but for the ma for the majority of people, the masses, quote unquote, uh, I don't think it's top of their agenda. So that's why I started pushing it. Okay, if you want, uh, you know, a no nosebleed introduction to Gen AI, join my webinar, and then from there, I offer a master class, and the response has been quite positive. So I feel that. Prompt engineering has a marketing problem <laughs> because it sounds so much, it sounds like a programming language. So, um, yeah, that's a problem that I feel can be resolved eventually. It's kind of like Excel, you know, nowadays. It's not un, unheard of for non-technical people, business people to use a spreadsheet. But back in the day, I started using Excel when I was in university, whoa, decades ago. It it felt like a super a super powered uh, no, tool, no. And then later, as I got into the workforce, I started my career in finance and banking. So Excel became rapidly adopt uh, adopted as a as a go to tool for many things. There was another tool, naman, in the Microsoft Arsenal, your Microsoft Access, which is technically a database that no one know, knew about or no one. Would would touch because it looks so complicated. So I, I I learned a lot about automation using access also combining the two because you can do workflows on access, you can do forms, uh, and that was my gateway drug to I uh, know proper databases, analytics, uh, even application development. You could do applications on access. So I feel that prompt Eng is the same. Um, it can be the gateway drug to AI. And many people also don't realize that if you want to build intelligent systems through these large language models, the real skill talaga is prompt engineering. You mean doing it manually or you're doing it in an automated manner. The prompt talaga determines the output. For now, no? at least how these uh, tools work. So I'm happy that I found at least one more person <laughs> who's into it. Uh, pero sige, let's go back. So how, how do you see Gen AI kind of changing the landscape for automation. Because automation has been around for some time. You have tools like yeah, and Zapier. Uh, and I think you mentioned AirOps Offline is an interesting tool also. Uh, I think they're relatively new. Pa nga, eh. There could be older yeah. workflow tools no, that I'm more used to, like Microsoft Access is one and so many others, mga ETL tools also. So how do you see this changing? Um. For me, I feel like Gen AI is just like the first step. So much growth. I mean, so much has happened the past year with AI when OpenAI launched Sora for um, video generation. It was really cool. Like the videos were very like developed and it was very high quality, I would say. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and it's not, it's probably, it's not perfect yet. Um, but eventually it's going to get there just like the developments and image generation and even Midjourney and Dolly can generate um, such high quality images. And I'm sure video generation is going to get to that, going to get there at some point. Mm -hmm. So I would say I don't have a clear view of where AI might be going because I, it feels like there's so much going on. Um, in different industries, all like pushing towards AI, um, that the growth could go in so many directions. And so um, that's that's the answer I would give is Gen AI is just like the first step. Yeah. And people really need to start adapting to it because there's going to be so much more growth from here on out. And I feel like even just knowing Gen AI like that at some point, like a few years down the line, that's going to be a must. And that's going to be, have that's going to have to be one of the things, basic things in your skill set that you would need to navigate in like a very AI powered world a few years from now. And then at the speed that the technology is changing, how do you see it Parang in the near term? Are are we or at least have you have you come to a point where the technology is stable enough to be integrated into workflows without fear of oh baka next month these APIs don't work anymore no and uh, the whole workflow is shot no do you ever have that feeling or get that challenge from from clients? 
Mm, not really, because I feel like probably like at least three years, like by the time I graduate, I feel like the same APIs and AI tools that I'm currently using to automate workflows are still going to be there, but probably more developed and updated. Okay. Sige. Um, I don't know if you're at liberty to disclose now. What are typical automation use cases? What's a, what's a popular one? Is it mostly web-related automation? Uh, marketing yeah. related automation what what i mean guide 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 us through the kind of the typical because you said you're gathering about automation problems yeah. that clients are doing so you can eventually package them so maybe maybe give us a run through of the top three or whatever so um i'll go back to the one i was talking about a while ago which is a blog writing blog and it's one of the really useful well, use cases that I would get as a request for me to build. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, before we moved on, I stopped at, we get to a point where the workflow is writing the article. And at this step, when the workflow is writing the article, this is where you would need to access different LLM models. So you could use GPT-4, Claude, Gemini, totally up to you as a builder of the workflow. Um, and this is where prompt engineering would be very important mm. because it cannot be a basic prompt. You need a system prompt, user assistant prompt, and usually for blog writing, since it's a bit long, the output is a bit long, I would go for one shot, one shot prompting. Mm -hmm. And so uh, system prompts, more of defining the character of the LLM for that step. And then user assistant pairs, I'd add one usefully for this one, one user assistant pair that just pretty much kind of shows the LLM, what kind of output you're expecting. So I treat it as kind of a chat. So the user goes, write an article about topic topic X. You add, um, you add a, an assistant um, response that, gives an ideal output. So you give an example of an ideal output and that assistant responds. And then you follow it up with another user prompt that says, okay, that's great. Now write um, an article about this topic. And that's when the output of that LLM would be the output of that workflow. Mm. So it's like the, the, they call it chain of thought. Yeah. It's like a chain of thought process. No, You do one prompt first, then a second prompt. And it's actually the second prompt that becomes the, the output. Okay. And then that's okay. managed out of a workflow tool or is that an yes. API call or panion? How does that work? Well, that's still, that's, I do all of that from AirOps. Okay. Okay. That's actually quite interesting as well because I don't think all automation platforms uh, support LLMs. No? So yeah. you, so AirOps is one uh, that does. No? Okay. Content creation. No? Uh, ano pa? Mm -hmm. What other... Uh, use cases are uh, pop up often uh, next to then uh, blog writing outreach, outreach email outreach okay so um for people who want to re whether that's cold outreach oh uh, well it's mostly like email writing so for people who want to write personalized emails hmm. um that's like one of the common ones I get um another one I would say social media like, yeah I was gonna ask so can can these tools interface with Facebook, uh, uh, Twit X, <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, because uh, there's a lot of automation possibilities, no? especially when mm -hmm. you look at social media ads and replies to posts. So is there an integration with Facebook? Uh, so right now on AirOps, there's no um, supported integration. So when I um, build workflows that involve social media platforms, I use the APIs of the platforms. So Meta API, I'm familiar with. Uh, it's the APIs that are hard to work with are Twitter and LinkedIn for me. Yeah, okay, because they're uh, less they're less developed, no, a bit more primitive. Um, Twitter is I need to pay to use like some APIs. LinkedIn, mm -hmm. like I, there is a whole review process that I need to go through for me to use their APIs. So that's why I usually default to Meta since um, it's easier to access yeah. and easier to test. Meta doesn't charge for you to use the API. No. Okay. That's very useful. 
Okay. Um. So it's content creation, outreach, social media. So it's all marketing related primarily. It's marketing automation basically. Okay. What about analytics? Any data analysis that lends itself well to I automation? I have tried once. Um, I worked on a project. Um, I'm not sure if it's data analytics, but more data extraction from a database or from a file. Like extract data from a file, structure it as a JSON, for example, and then push it to this database. Um, so that those kinds of use cases. So um, it's really use cases that really need the help of AI models or LLM models, rather. Mm -hmm. And so um, because the data extraction part, these are files that are very huge and, and, and there's no standard data that it needs to extract, meaning it needs to look for, let's say, cities, for example. Yeah. And, um, and let's say in a huge file, um, extract all the cities from that and then push the cities into this database. So similar to those kinds of workflows, but more complex. Okay. No, I mean, it's very fascinating because people tend to, I mean, I'm going to speak from experience. Uh, people are like into hardcore AI, hardcore AI, and you know, data science. They tend to look down on this stuff. But these are like the day-to-day -day stuff that businesses look for, marketing automation, email automation, social media automation. And it's less about... Kaya nga, ano eh, um, I don't know how to phrase this. No? I'm just probably going to raise eyebrows. Part of the AI conversation is less about machine learning. It's about machine doing. <laughs> diba? Now, I had that term. Eh. Too much machine learning, not enough machine doing. Because at some point, Whatever model you design, whether it's using a large language model or a customized, you know, predictive algorithm, needs to be able to trigger and respond to a process. Mga function calls lang naman dapat yan, di ba? And that's how you realize returns, di ba? From, from the exercise. Up until model development, setup, that's all cost. Parang ikaw, no? You're hired by a client, that's cost. But if what you set up ends up uh, uh, improving quantity uh, for same cost or improving quality, reducing errors, that's where the financial return comes from. Increased revenue, uh, better uh, reduced cost per, per cost income ratio. And uh, more importantly, it's uh, no, uh, it's not just cost savings, it's revenue growth. Basically, you're increasing the revenue line and reducing the cost line. How do you normally, uh, because you're doing it as a freelancer, as an entrepreneur, is that is it flat rate or do you get like a success fee from the cost savings? Uh, so it's really flat rate. Um, and uh, I think you asked this offline, whether the projects are like one-off. And the usual case is one client would have three project ideas and okay. we work on those projects one by one. Um, so that's the usual case. Um, the timeline might um, vary depending on the complexity of the project. But yeah. Okay. No, I'm just thinking out loud um, in terms of as an opportunity. Not that I want to encourage more competitors, but it seems like an unserved demand in my in my book, uh, people who can navigate all of these tools and then uh, and execute. And well, how's the the market demand for automation platforms? You mentioned AirOps. I'd imagine AirOps is fairly recent uh, innovation. Do you see that space also changing over time? Are there more competitors coming in? More options for people who want to do that same service that you're doing? I think so. Yes. Um, Arab is fairly new. I, if I'm not mistaken, they started last year, early last year, or it's been about a year or around more or less for them since they started. And so when I actually got into Arabs, there were around like a hundred people on their Slack channel, um, which I joined. Um, now there's about like close to 500, if I'm not mistaken, maybe more. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I really see so much growth. I mean, I've seen Aerox grow so much in the past four months even. And it's become so useful for me as well as a, one of the builders there on their platform. And so I think, um, who know? I feel like there's going to be competitors in that space as well for um, platforms that allow people um, to build automated workflows. Uh, and I think Zapier, as useful as it is in terms of integration, if we're talking about AI-powered workflows, there's still not a lot of platforms that support it, as you said. And that's why I fell in love with AirOps is because it is very AI-centric. Mm -hmm. it, really, it really focuses on the addition of AI into your workflows. Into a workflow. No, I think this is a core skill because um, I mean, this might be the first time I'll be sharing it on the podcast. Um, one of the things that I'm actively lobbying, uh, both on using my my courses and through you know partnerships like IBPAP, is I feel the the jobs related to AI uh, need to be redefined. No? They're no longer just a carryover from what was what is often discussed in the data science era or the analytics era. Because let's say I use the, the AAP's um, professional maturity framework as an example. So we used to define jobs, five types of jobs related to AI or related to data. Data stewards, data engineers, data scientists, functional analysts, which is data ana uh, analysis, but you might find them in marketing and finance. And then the analytics leader, see in Lima. And when AI started to become, uh, Gen AI started to become a thing, suddenly new things started to pop up, like AI engineer, as uh, distinct from a machine learning engineer, which is close to a data scientist, data engineer hybrid. But it's still very kind of algorithmic, uh, algorithm centric. No? Uh, and then prompt engineering popped in. And for me, I immediately saw that's new. That's like everyone else. That's the That's the typical user. So, uh, and then integrating AI within a, a process, that's a different skill. That's like process re-engineering, design thinking, something along those lines. And then you mentioned workflows. So I feel that that now needs to have a, a place. No? So the, as opposed to those typical job titles, I'm calling the, the workforce for the AI age kind of clusters into four, parang four buckets. First are the builders. So this is everyone from a data engineer to an AI engineer. Basically, anyone building uh, stuff, which which includes workflows. Uh, although, I, I do, I, although I want to make an argument that you don't necessarily need to be a developer to do a workflow, question mark. No, I don't know if you'll agree there. Uh, second is the user. So these are the broad population of business people you know, who may or may not need to know how to tweak AI, but they certainly need to know how to use it and use it for process improvement. So prompt engineering is here. Um, but arguably, it can workflow. Eh. So that might be a user skill, pala, not necessarily a builder skill. So we want to distinguish between those who build RAG systems and fine-tuning versus those who do like day-to-day -day workflow optimization. Kind of like Excel does that also for for the typical user. So dalawa na yun. The third skill uh, group is leader or planner. Um, sometimes I say leader, sometimes I say planner. And these are people who not necessarily needing to know how AI works and how to deploy it uh, or even prompt engineering, although they could use it. But they're now able to step back and see in the broad scheme of you know pro processes what processes need to be automated. Baka dun din yung workflow. Because the thing I'm thinking there is they need uh, a bit of design thinking because they need to have the user in mind. Uh, when I say user, the ultimate client, no, and you're building to that. Or it could be the internal users. And then see how existing system uh, caters to those needs. No? And actually, that's a, that's a very, very rare skill. Those who get into leadership positions who know how to design processes. So baka workflow is there too. And then there's another term called process mining that they keep running into, which sounds like a very technical way of looking at 
process flows and looking at bottlenecks. Uh, very six sigma, you know, so you need third. The fourth profile is more of what cuts across because obviously to birth these three profiles, you need people who can train. You know? And if I look at the current scenario, we have schools, teachers who would rather ban AI than use it. <laughs> so there is no acceptance no, of how AI can be used. So not only do they need to be able to train people to use AI, they need to be able to use AI to train. Yun, no? That's a very crucial skill. And I think of the four, only builders get represented in training and you know workshops. There's a lot of training about AI, diba? You know, uh, uh, not just prompt engineering, like AI engineering, RAG, dami mga workshops. But for the other three profiles, if you knew you needed to get trained, you don't you don't know where to get it. So I feel that workflow management and how would you call this automation workflows, workflow automation, workflow based automation? How do you call it? I call it workflow automation, but I'm very much focused on AI powered workflow automation. No, yeah, yeah, that should be a qualifier. Cause see, you could do workflow anyway within without with or without AI, no. But if we're gonna connect that thing, um, what what are air uh the competitors of AirOps? The other Zapier, uh, Integromat. What are others? I'd a Zapier, Integromat, or Make a Pipe Dream. And N8N, I would say. What about Power the, Automate? You heard of that? I heard I hear that a lot. The, That's in the, the Microsoft stack. Okay. Wow. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah. So what used to be MS Access has now been blown up into what they call power apps. Okay. I'm and, familiar with access. Yeah. So I don't know. Have have a look. Cause if you deal with clients who are on an Azure or Microsoft stack. They might have a bias for power mm -hmm. stuff. They call it power apps. Power automates one of them. Power BI is the visualization tool, etc. No. So and it's also workflow based. You know, maybe we can geek out on all of this in another episode. No, let's just do a sample automation. Uh kasi, ah, there's another thing. No, I don't know. I don't know to what extent it still exists, but it used to be a very petty point, petty for me. Ah, na, you're, you, parang you can divide the world between those who love to code and only code and those who don't like to code and rather do low or no code. And I'm assuming air ops and the rest fall into that latter category. Uh, and But if you talk to you know, hardcore coders, whether they're developers or not, they'd rather write scripts. And I think the middle ground is in some workflow tools, because I remember I used to use a tool called Nime. Uh, before Nime is like a workflow-based analytics tool. You literally, you know, stitch nodes together, and each node does a specific thing. So it forces you to think in terms of steps, like load Excel file, chop off column three and four. You know, you, you mga nodes yeah. and then summarize, sum, you know, average, ganyan, and then load it into a regression, and then all the way to produce Excel sheet. So you have this long, you know, string of stuff. And then for lack of, uh, if there's a certain uh, parang function that you don't know, you have the option of writing code and putting it in a node. I think at that time it was Java. Pero ngayon, it's probably Python or JavaScript. So in a way, you can have a code snippet no? in a workflow, parang in and out. No? Um, pero even then, ano eh? uh, it doesn't work. Uh, I mean, not, not so many people work that way. Eh? They'd rather have a like a Python notebook or, you know, it's a straight through kind of process. Uh, and you know, the, I mean, if you cross, when you cross over into software developer territory na, or web developer, there is a sense of creating these microservices, which are essentially just in and out processes also. So you load up, you fire up a process, technically it ingests data, does something with it, and then shoots it back out. Uh, whether it's a web-based microservice or an internal one. Probably all operates on the same protocol anyway. You know, it's everyone, everything's connected to a network, everything's a server. And that's already abstracted out no, in an air ops workflow. Parang they handle all of that behind the scenes. But the more hardcore way of doing it is to like build it step by step, which makes it very painful. I think that's what the trade-off is. You may you you can make it painless, but then you're now locked into a platform ecosystem. You no. Know? So you build something on air ops. You gotta keep using it now. It's gonna be very hard to get out of it. Or is that a misnomer or a, a disinformation? 
I'm a bit confused by what you mean. Like, what do you mean by locked into the platform? So, if you use AirOps to do automation, they mm-hmm. have to have AirOps, tama? No? Could they do what you build without AirOps or abstract it out? Diba tama? They, ha- they need to have yeah. it, right? Yeah. That means they need so to subscribe to it, blah, blah, blah. So, okay. So, it's hosted on AirOps and that's... I guess I haven't encountered that problem yet since mm. so far all of my clients already have AirOps accounts. And so that's probably something I have to think about too. Um, but I would say so far my clients are open to using any platform needed mm-hmm. to automate their workflows. And for them, they kind of there are some clients who want me to decide what platform would be best to build the workflow in. And it doesn't necessarily have to be AirOps. I think my default is just AirOps because of the ease of use and accessing and kind of prompting the LLM. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And I think ano nga eh, it's people who get past all of this hype about the AI and just because everything we've talked about so far, there's no hype here. It's like get get your hands dirty and yeah. build something. And I think that's where the attitude should be. And you know, when people start talking automation, workflow, suddenly the fear of, oh no, we're gonna lose jobs. Actually, frankly, some jobs ought to be automated out. No, that doesn't mean the person goes jobless, they just become more efficient at what they do. I think that's uh it, I mean for me the classic uh analogy is Excel didn't kill accounting. No. I'm an accountant by training. Eh? You just made accountants powered by Excel. And if you're one of those few who did not bother, uh then you probably will go jobless. But for the rest of the profession, they they adopted the tool. So I feel it's the same way for any type of AI automation. It's not the automation that you need to worry about. You know, it's the adoption rate. And people's yeah. openness to change that that's uh, you know similar. Yeah, and go since you mentioned adoption rate, it also just goes back to, especially in our country, our society here in the Philippines, if you want to really get ahead in the AI, AI industry, who do you go um, to train you? Um, because there are a lot of schools, and I'm speaking and I'm saying this as a student. Mm. Um, when AI started like in the middle of my senior high and college that there really was a push against AI. And I understand, I understand the stance, but I also understand, I also feel like there should be a way for us to have AI and education work hand in hand. And um, it's one of the things that, uh, I kind of like in Simf, like they have a product called Lesson Planner PH. I'm not sure if you've heard of this. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. So they have teachers uh, use Lesson Planner to help them have their lesson plans. And um, have you heard of the news about DepEd proposing that they would um, change the school year schedule for high school for students? No. Um, Another I'm change? Not, yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen? Don't, I don't think it got um, accepted, though. The proposal got accepted. Okay. But it would, I think that's, if it did get accepted or if it does get accepted, um, it would be hard, not only on the students who are going to have like around two weeks of summer, but also the teachers who, are, who need to prepare lesson plans for the new school year. And so like, I just thought of that scenario and like that's a scenario when the education sector would really need to look towards AI. Mm. And I feel like before, even before something like that would happen where the education sector gets pressured into a corner for them to eventually use AI, I feel like they kind of need to start at least like glancing towards AI and how it would work hand in hand with education. Yeah, for me, I know the high level... I I I might be oversimplifying, but the high level symptom is we need the education sector to do one to do two things. You have two jobs, sabi ko nga. Produce labor mm-hmm. and produce knowledge. And on both fronts, they're failing there. The labor is not up to quality. They're not getting hired. Uh and you know, grades are falling. And I, I know every other teacher I've met 
are be, is behind their quota in terms of they have a quota <laughs> to produce research papers. And the biggest bugbear for both is admin, which is easily automatable. Yun yun eh. Parang you have all this paperwork, admin work. A lot of it is repetitive. A lot of it is a completely uninspiring work, <laughs> but it needs to be done. And you know, it takes someone like you to just jump in there and say, okay, one, two, three, four, five, the machine can do that in and out. Uh, but that conversation isn't happening. And there's all these, you know, uh, you know, um, I mean, just relieving teachers of X percent of their paperwork is an immediate uptick. And that's not speaking to another fundamental issue, which is our curricula is sorely outdated. You know, we're training people based on the standards of the early 20th century, maybe the late 19th century, when we're already, uh, you know, on our way to the mid 21st century, fourth industrial revolution. So can you imagine how much, well, you're ready, you're still in school, how much useless stock information you need to learn before you, you, Viva, before you start learning practical stuff. Now on the flip side, man, there's this, the boot camp mentality where you just learn what you need to learn. You can get employed, pero I feel there's something missing also there. Uh, there are other things you pick up in in school that can still be useful, mostly soft skills, relationship skills, uh, organization skills. Um, so there's a trade-off. Pero right mm -hmm. now, I'd say it's overloaded with useless stock knowledge, less about practical stuff. And even the practice of educating needs to be re-educated. Uh, and that's the crux of it. The unfortunate part about this, from my own experience and opinion only, is education by default is credentials. And mm -hmm. you need to be credentialed to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And even then, you suffer the red tape of the credentialists. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so I realize we're at the hour. <laughs> Bilis, no? Um, anything you want to share to the audience about what you do, automation? Of course, we have to save some for the next episode um, before we wrap up. Sure, maybe I can just end with... Um, I would say, um, I guess if you're listening to this already, maybe you're, you've already started getting an interest in the AI space, or maybe you've even like started something of your own in the AI space. And I would say if you're already starting something, continue it for sure. If not yet, then I would say start. Um, the earliest time you should have started was way back when ChatGPT um, came into the Philippines. And the second earliest time you can start this now um, and get ahead of... AI, uh, and it's just upskill yourself and equip yourself with the knowledge. You don't need to, I guess it's not a necessity to get to my level where you're building full business, uh, automating full business processes for other businesses. But I would say just even understanding the AI, the different models and seeing where it might go would help a lot. Um, with whatever you're doing, whether you're a student, employed, or running your own business. Yeah, and I want to add, doing it while you're still studying. I mean, <laughs> and for me, you know, and a props to you, Zoe, for just breaking that mold. You know? Parang, kasi I hear a lot of, you know, banter. Because I've, I've had interns before. And they keep saying, oh, I want to wait until I have experience or take my first job before I... Like there was one who's a long time intern with us, already graduated, now is working with us. And I'm saying, what's keeping you from starting your company? You know, I still need to get experience. It's because that's how I thought back in the day. And I'm saying, okay, if you were, if this was 30 or so years ago, I would permit that. But no, now there's no reason. You have the internet. Well, I didn't have the internet back in the day. You know, you have AI, you have all of these tools. At worst, you maybe need to borrow a little money if you need a runway for... But a lot of these tools actually are free or very cheap. It's just the knowledge no, that you need to accumulate. And again, mm -hmm. what's stopping you? And then here you are just shredding it. <laughs> you haven't even graduated yet. Kaya I feel that's an artificial requirement. Na nga eh. 
that's really great. I mean, I, I really enjoyed our talk, Zoe. And hopefully, I can have you again in another episode. Thank you, Doc.